My name's Jim Glassman. I'm a visiting, uh, think about what am I, I'm some kind of fellow. I used to be a regular fellow, then became a senior fellow, now I'm a visiting fellow. So I'm, uh, I'm sort of just visiting, but actually doing a little bit more than that. Um, and where I'm visiting is uh, what we at AI call the Center for Internet Communications and Technology Policy, which was started here just a little over two years ago. Uh, we do research. We have an excellent blog at techpolicydaily.com, and we do events like this, which is uh, titled The Disruptors, a series that we started about a year ago that has featured in the past uh, such tech luminaries as Eric Schmidt from Google and Peter Thiel of, of PayPal and uh, the, the first... Uh, private investor and outside investor in, uh, in Facebook. Um, today, my interlocutor is not so obviously a techie. Uh, she is Catherine Bradley, a board member of the KIPP Foundation and of Princeton University, uh, chair of the Washington Regional Board for Teach for America, and co-chair of the education transition team of, of Mayor Gray. She's also president of City Bridge Foundation, a nonprofit that she started 21 years ago with her husband, David Bradley, of The Atlantic. It's working to build a citywide system of high performing schools. As the City Bridge website puts it incredibly well, Washington can be the first large city where poverty is not destiny. Poverty is important to us here at AEI. I think, as, as almost all of you in this audience know, our president, Arthur Brooks, uh, has, has made fighting poverty uh, a very high priority here at AEI. And, uh, and Arthur has been called by NBC News the conservative poverty guru. <laughs> and guru is actually a good phrase for, for Arthur, if you know him. Um, in Catherine Bradley's case, uh, the way to sever the connection between poverty and destiny is through education. And what does all that have to do with technology? Well, we shall see. Uh, before we get started, uh, just a few little announcements. You can tweet this event at hashtag AEI Disruptors. We're being streamed online, and the video will be available approximately 24 hours after the event uh, on the AEI website. And Catherine and I will talk for about 40 minutes, and then we'll have questions from the audience. So, Catherine, let's end the suspense. What is the <laughs> connection between a technology and improving schools? Sure. So I just first have to say, you make me so nervous to put me in the lineup of Eric Schmidt <laughs> and Peter Thiel. <laughs> well, th there were others. Okay, <laughs> okay. So <laughs> and so I, and I think you're, you're going to be you're going to be much more interesting than they were. Okay, you know, so. let's let's hope so. Um, <laughs> all right, I will try everyone. I have some really good friends in the audience, so they'll come to my rescue. Yes, okay. absolutely. <laughs> so, um, connection between technology and improving education. I, I brought only two slides. Those of you who know me know that I am prone to have long, long slide decks. Only two today, I promise. And I think. Almost everybody knows what I mean if I say this is a slide of the old kind of quote factory model of education and probably isn't truly historically accurate to call it a factory model because kids weren't all being prepared to go to factories. But the point of the slide is that this was the old method of education that probably all of us were educated in a way that looked like this with whole group instruction for everyone and pretty much all the kids look alike, they're all the same age, they're all doing exactly the same thing, they're all in desks sitting there looking forward, and they're probably doing exactly what the teacher is telling them to do in a responsive way. And this next slide is a school in South Los Angeles called KIPP Empower. It is a high poverty, uh, almost 100% African American school, and it, it's not one of the most innovative schools out there. But it is an example of probably what is typical around the country when schools begin experimenting with technology. And to answer the question really specifically, what's improving education here is not really that there are computers in the classroom. And it's not really even that those computers 
allow personalization, which is true, and they do, the real innovation and the real disruption is that what you're seeing here is a delinking of two things that have been in this tight inverse relationship for the whole history of education, and that is how student-centered the education can be and the scale of that education. So throughout all of history, like the model for all of us would have been to have a private tutor, totally student-centered education. You would get exactly what you needed, when you needed it, on the pace that mattered, and they'd stay with you until you got to mastery. And that's never been possible to provide a private tutor for every child. As scale got bigger, the student-centeredness of the education got smaller. So what technology has done that is the huge disruption is to break that tight linkage and allow real personalization to happen at scale. And once that happens, all sorts of good things downstream can happen. So uh, give us some examples of how, that, how that's working. Sure. So um, let's actually do this example since it's up on the screen. Uh, this is called a station rotation model. And it is not the most innovative thing that's out there. It's, I'd say, it's right in the middle of the pack for innovations in education that are happening. And this school is very interesting because the way they got to this model was kind of, um, you know, innovation was, was, was birthed out of necessity. This school in South LA uh, had marketed itself to parents as having a small and low student-teacher ratio. Uh, because they were using the California uh, subsidies for class size reduction to get down to a 20 to 1 ratio students to teachers. And at the last minute, California took that funding away, and all of a sudden they were going to have a 28 to 1 ratio. And what were they going to do? They'd marketed themselves as being much more personalized, much more individualized. So they decided to reorganize the classroom using technology into this station rotation model, where a third of the time, kids are accessing content that is leveled just right for them. A third of the time, they're in a small group, generally eight on one with a teacher. And then a third of the time, it's hard to see, but over on the left, they're working on a project. And what that did is it not only created personalization for every child, but it recaptured the small group work with the teacher at an even better ratio than they thought they were going to have when they were 20 to 1. And a lot of good things seem to be coming from schools that are organizing like this, which we can talk about now or later. Oh, let's, let's talk about it just a little later. I, you know, maybe I'm deceiving myself, but I sat in a regular old classroom with 30 people and, you know, 30 kids and a desk and one teacher. And I think that I got a really good education. Mm -hmm. I mean, again, maybe I'm kidding myself. Um, do you think I would have learned a whole lot more if I had done that? Uh, so I sat in a class with probably 25 to 1, and I got a great education too. But I often got like workbooks to move ahead if I wanted it. Mm -hmm. And I think the right way to think about the kind of education we both had is that it was perfect for about a third of the kids. Probably a third of the kids really were ready to move forward and were bored. And a third of the kids really did not understand the lesson and weren't being given the time or the skills they needed to catch up. And that roughly corresponds with where we've ended up as a nation in terms of college graduation, too, at about 30%. Um, I, John Rice was at my offices from DCPS, who's right over here, uh, today. and. Um, a teacher was doing a presentation, and she put up a thing on the board to prove this. It was a complicated passage in Spanish, which asked us to come up with an answer. And my Spanish is poor. And she then said to the room, how many of you thought that was too easy? About a third of the people. How many of you couldn't do it? I was in that category. That was more than a third. For how many was this? challenging, but you felt you could be successful. Three people in the room only. And she said, so my job as a teacher is to make sure all of you are working at that. It's a challenge, and it's hard, but you're able to succeed. And this lesson, one lesson for everybody, failed for all of you but three. And I think that's probably been happening more than we all understand. Mm -hmm. It's been the most able students who've been fine with it mm -hmm. or have been a little bit bored but still gotten by. Um, you know, when I was uh, at the, the Bush 
Institute, President Bush's Policy Institute in Dallas, we started a program to improve the quality of um, school principals, thinking that leadership was important, and it's still, it's still going on. And I, I got an email from uh, Chris DeMuth, who used to be the president of AEI, and he said, in effect, what are you doing this for? It's this, the school system, the, the traditional public school system needs to be blown up completely. You can make little incremental improvements within it, but really, it's got to change in a massive way. And you're really, you're sort of holding things up. How do you feel about that? Um, so I focus on Washington, D.C., where we actually have the school, the traditional school system that's the fastest improving in the country. So it's really hard to make that argument here when you see the massive change and improvement we've had. And when we've had two leaders in a row, Kaya Henderson and Michelle Ree before her, who've been willing to change things radically. Michelle Ree changed all of human capital, hiring, teacher evaluation, teacher tenure completely. Kaya Henderson has changed curriculum and rigor completely, and she has implemented very innovative things around blended learning. So it's hard for me to say that about my district. Mm -hmm. Maybe everybody would feel parochial about their own districts in the same way. Mm -hmm. um, I, I also am a big proponent of our charter system here, which has allowed enormous innovation in models and the type of diversity of education that's being offered. I don't advocate for us to move toward 100% charter system the way New Orleans is, because I think then the system has to then regulate to make sure everybody's providing something of the same kind of base education. So you get away from some of the purpose of having charter schools. I favor a model like ours that has the diversity of both systems. How many students are in charter schools in, in Washington? 44% of our students. That's really good. 56 are in traditional publics, and we're, I think we're about 86,000 total public school kids. So you don't agree with, uh, t and I don't even know how to pronounce his last name, Ted Coldery, is that his name? Who sent us both his book, yeah. which I thought was very interesting. And he had, there's a quote from his book, the current system is giving the most it can. It's kind mm -hmm. of an interesting mm -hmm. way of looking at it. It's sort of what I was saying before. So you don't agree with that, clearly. Well, I think I agreed with like 95% of his book. <laughs> um, what I don't agree with is that it is impossible to get performance improvements in the traditional public school system. Mm -hmm. we're, we're showing in DC that it is possible. It, I also have a lot of views about how hard that is to do, but mm -hmm. um, I think what I liked most about his book is how he framed so many of the reforms that we've been doing as a sector have really been focused on pushing performance improvement into the system. Mm -hmm. And fine, go keep doing that, but please work on innovative models over on the side as well. So l l let's talk about that. Um, what are the innovative models that are working in Washington, mm -hmm. D.C.? So we... Um, we are not yet California, so we don't quite have the same breadth of schools for people to go see yet, but we're working on it. In fact, one thing we're doing is running our own little Y Combinator type program called Breakthrough Schools DC. You have to, to explain try to, to people what Y Combinator is. Okay, Y Combinator is a platform in the tech sector that connects investors who want to invest in startups with those startups, but it provides a lot of the supports and the um, kind of the, the push forward that those startups need to be ready to be investable. So if you mm -hmm. take that and kind of apply it over to the education sector, uh, we've had big national foundations wanting to invest in innovative school models. We also have funders and philanthropists here in Washington interested in this sector as well. Two of them who are our partners are in this room today on this, um, on this project, Breakthrough Schools DC. We decided to put together this platform that could work with teams of educators or schools here in DC who wanted to do innovative school design. And we would create our own kind of Stanford design school process that they would all go through. With the idea being that at the end of the process, the teams who had great proposals could apply for significant funding to go back and either launch or redesign a school. So there are 13 schools in that cohort now um, they are in different stages of getting launched. I'll talk about one other school, which is already up and running, not part of our program, but certainly within the City Bridge family of schools. Uh, it's called Ingenuity Prep. Has anybody been there in the room? Okay. 
Uh, it's in far Ward 8. It has a very high risk population of kids. It starts with three year olds. They are using adaptive digital technology starting at three year olds. But their real design breakthrough is that they've totally changed what a classroom looks like and what the teacher hierarchy looks like within the school. So the class sizes are much larger. There are four teachers in every classroom, a master teacher all the way down to a teacher in training. And then that group of four teachers cycles with the kids. I think it's for three full years. They stay with that same age group of kids, which is really important because we all know that one of the things missing from the lives of kids who are growing up in severe poverty or exposed to trauma is they need stable relationships at schools. So the, the design here is not just the adaptive technology and the content, but it's rethinking and redesigning the role of the teacher. There are other schools here too I can talk so, about. So, the, so the, 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 students are to get, the students are together for three years, is that what you're saying? So the, the class of kindergartners right. has a group of four teachers, and when they become first graders, oh, I see. So they move the four up teachers as, as they move would, with them. As they would yep. in a normal school. Although one of, one of the points you make is that, you know, why, why do you have kids that are all the same age in the same class? Well, that is going to be a major disruption when that happens and we can begin mixing it up. Mm -hmm. uh, it is happening a little bit in California right now that there are schools where the content is really, you get rid of the grade levels and you get rid of curriculum that matches up to a grade level. And there is a course of study that all kids must finish and they can move through it at their own pace and find their own path through it. Summit Prep, which is in California and Seattle, if they can hold on because the Seattle court just made charter schools illegal. Uh, so right. who knows what's going to happen with that school. But uh, Summit is probably the very best example around the country of this totally student-paced school. And I've never been there yet, but um, my team members who have say it is sublime to see it. Mm. Uh, and Summit has now done something called Summit Base Camp. And we have two schools in D.C. going through Summit Base Camp. So soon we may have a Summit-like And wh what about the school in Seattle where there are no textbooks? Sure. So the simplest way to think about technology in schools is just when a school says, let's go one-to-one, -one, meaning we're going to have a device, a laptop, or a tablet mm -hmm. for every student, and they will access all of their course content, their homeworks, their homework and their textbooks off of that tablet. And I think the school, um, we have schools that are one-to-one -one here in Washington. One is, um, the best example is probably a charter school called DC International. The school I had mentioned to you is called Sammamish High School. It's a traditional public school. Mm -hmm. It is in Bellevue, Washington. It is the poorest or the highest free and reduced meal lunch school in the of the four high schools in the Bellevue School District. They've just rebuilt the whole school and it looks like you're at a technology firm. There are beautiful big glass windows going down all the halls. There are no lockers because there are no books except for novels. They do keep real novels for English class. Every classroom has beautiful huge windows. The staircases and the furniture is bright. It feels like you're at Google. Mm -hmm. And everything they do is off of the Microsoft OneNote uh, tablet. Free food? Like uh, uh, we got free food. I know the kids got free food. <laughs> um, and, and what about um, Randall Highlands in Washington? Sure. So I mentioned that our traditional public school system here is doing tremendously innovative things. One of the things they've done is to create a feeder pattern around this model. This is in South Los Angeles, but this model, the station rotation model, is the model Kaya Henderson is using in this feeder pattern of schools. Um, Randall Highlands is one of the elementary schools in that feeder pattern. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, what they've done is to get rid of almost all whole group instruction. So everything the kids are doing in the school is personalized. And the teacher, the principal, actually told me that she will often walk up and down the hall, and if she sees a teacher doing whole group instruction, she'll tap her watch to just remind them. No more than a couple minutes of whole group instruction. We want the kids working on the content they need in the modality that they learn best. Now, this seems to put a lot of pressure on teachers. I, I noticed on your website you have a, a, a McKinsey study by Byron August, whom I knew, by the way, in Dallas, uh, among others, that, that 
says, the quality of an education cannot exceed the quality of its teachers, and makes the point that um, top performing mm -hmm. nations recruit teachers, 100% mm -hmm. uh, of them from the top one third of college graduates, where in the United States it's 23%, only 23% of schools <laughs> recruit their teachers from the top one third, and 14% of high poverty schools, which I guess would be DC, recruit from the top third. So how can, I mean, does, doesn't this put more pressure on, yes. on teachers? And are teachers able, at the, the quality that we have, are they able to do it? Or do we need to recruit different kinds of teachers? So I don't know the answer to the second part of the question. Uh, I think one of the biggest frustrations for teachers nationwide is when they work unbelievably hard and they still don't feel like they're successful with their kids. And one of the things that using adaptive technology can do is it can actually allow you to reach all kids, which if we can increase teacher satisfaction relative to the how hard they work, that will be huge. There is no question that getting to lead a classroom like this requires a lot of retraining. Uh, the teacher fellowship that CityBridge runs gives teachers a full year and a day off from their classrooms every month to just expose them to blended learning and give them the time and space to experiment in their, in their own classrooms. I believe that um, most teachers want to be successful with their kids and they will see the benefit of using adaptive technology. But I think it's harder. It's harder to be an orchestra conductor, making sure every part of the orchestra is working together than it is to play one instrument well in front of your classroom. So, it, there's no question that this will be more challenging for the teaching force. There are also some things, some little tiny things that have to be fixed that are truly a pain for teachers about a digital classroom. If you have, uh, if you're teaching English and you go home at night with a folder full of paragraphs to grade, you know exactly what you have to do. You have it all there in one folder. You can go through, do them, you know when you're done. If you're having to log into each student's account, and pull up the right folder with the right paragraph, correct it online, and then put it back in the folder the way it's supposed to be. Those are extra steps for the teacher. Not everyone likes that. Uh, well, let's, let's talk about some hot button issues. What do you think of Common Core? Um, I am a big fan of Common Core, and our city has moved forward practically without a hitch around Common Core. Um, I, I am distressed by the political toxicity that has been tanking it everywhere around the country. So DC is part of the Park Consortium, which I think is, is it 19 states? Dimitri, I bet you know, 19 states in the District of Columbia. Um, and so we just took the first Common Core Align test last spring. The results will come out at the end of this month or early in November. Our proficiency rates will drop and drop dramatically. Doesn't mean the kids are any less proficient than they were before. It just means we've reset where the bar for real college completion or real college readiness should be. And if we look at what happened in Tennessee, which um, in about the year 2010, they raised their standards tremendously. Their scores really dropped. But then that new bar actually incented a lot of improvement. And you can already see between 2010 and now the improvement in Tennessee, which is the other state, which has is fastest improving in the country. And what, what, do, you th what do you think of testing in general? Um, I, I am a little, so most of my colleagues who like innovative learning don't like testing at all. Um, I have personally never seen a fantastic classroom where wonderful learning was happening that didn't also do well on the state tests. So I just don't buy it that it's not possible to have deep learning and real student engagement and also pass the state tests. I think that what they really should do is have a floor underneath learning, say, we want to make sure that we test everyone so that we catch it if there are huge achievement gaps, so that we catch it if there's some schools that are moving way ahead and some that are not. Uh, what gets hard is when it's used in a purely punitive way rather than in a way to help some schools get better and to target resources. But um, do you think the testing is a legitimate way to, um, to find out whether teachers are doing a good job? So 
I actually loved it when Michelle Ree said, every teacher wants his or her students to grow every year. And there's not a single teacher in the country who would or should be happy if their students stay at the exact same level at the end of the year that they were at the beginning of the year. So I think it's valid. I don't believe it should be a huge portion of any teacher's evaluation. Some of the most innovative schools we work with are beginning to come up with interesting multiple measures and ways to assess some of the softer skills and some of the, the non-cognitive skills that we know are really important to student success across time. Like the school summit, which is totally self-paced in California, is actually beginning to assess qualities like resilience and grit and communication skills, because they think those are so important. And if we don't come up with quantitative ways to measure them, they're going to disappear in terms of focus of schools. How are we going to measure grit quantitatively? I don't know, because the schools that begin to emphasize it usually find that student self-assessments drop dramatically once they realize where the bar is. So how you get an objective outside measurement, I'm not really sure. I mentioned um, leadership. And uh, just as the, these innovations are difficult for teachers, um, they're probably even more difficult for school leaders, for principals. Mm -hmm. um, how big a problem do you think uh, school leadership is? So I, I'm a big Jim Collins fan, and the whole Jim Collins frame that uh, unit-level leadership is the key to excellence in every industry everywhere, that's so true in education as well. That concept of unit-level leadership at the school or in the classroom mm -hmm. matters hugely. Um, there's a lot going on to try to train principals to be both instructional leaders and to be the business leaders of their school and their unit. Um, I think those are really bearing fruit. I, John, you have not been through the DCPS, um, the, the Georgetown program, have you? No. no. Well, there's a, there's a number of things we're doing here locally, both with Georgetown University and in terms of creating a principal training program within DCPS that are bearing fruit. The KIPP schools have one of the best principal training programs in the country. It's called the Fisher Fellowship. They spend a year in training, traveling the country, and going to Stanford Business School. So people are beginning to understand how important the position of principal is, and it's beginning to get the recognition and the level of training that I think it deserves. Um, and and KIPP, is, KIPP is obviously doing a great job, but when you, and, and you're on the board, but when you talk to the KIPP people, they, they say that's actually their greatest constraint, is finding and keeping leaders. And you're also on the board of Teach for America, and that's, that's also a problem there, is kind of moving teachers into right. those positions. Um, so let's talk about charter schools for a second. 44% okay. uh, of, of charter schools in uh, uh, Washington students are attending charter schools. And so you were saying it's, it's better to have 44% than 100%? I would not wish 100% charters on our city, because I think the autonomy and the innovation that you find in charter schools now would have to go away if we were regulating one system. So, so what's the limit? 44? <laughs> um, 60? You know, I would never speculate on what the right number is. But what's interesting about our city right now is that both sectors are growing. Hmm. The traditional public schools are growing. I think they started growing two years ago, and this is a huge change from what's happened across the last decade. I believe both sectors grew by about 3% last year. I think the numbers are not fully in right now. So that means they'll stay at their relative percentages um, for another year. And the charter schools are getting better not just by adding new schools, but they're also aggressively ch closing poor performing schools. I would rather stay at 44% and have our charter sector get better and better and better every year than I would have it grow and have the quality decline. Um, so w one of the things that you, you mentioned earlier, and if you could elaborate on it, is your Education Innovation Fellowship. Mm -hmm. Talk to us about that. Sure. So I think I mentioned we have this program of trying to um, be a catalyst for innovative schools. And none of this works if you don't have the pipeline of human talent mm -hmm. who is familiar with 
the technology, knows how it works in schools, has seen schools where it's working. Uh, we are now heading into our fourth year of something called the Education Innovation Fellowship. Microsoft Corporation is our funding partner for it. They've been a fantastic partner. They brought a whole group of us out to Seattle to see schools, uh, which is where I saw Sammamish High School. And we're trying to give teachers a full year to have the time and space to really investigate what blended learning could look like in their classrooms. And everyone is required. It's a January to December fellowship. Some people say that's so disruptive. Why are you not following the school year? Well, it's because we want them to have the summer to develop a technology-based pilot <laughs> that then can actually be in their classroom starting in September. So they learn about the best models out there in the spring, develop the pilot with a lot of support from us across the summer, and then implement it in the fall. And what we've tried to do is be very intentional about choosing the teacher leaders in every building. The whole point is that their success in their classrooms and their comfort level with using innovation in their classrooms can then spread within their schools. Um, you, I'm gonna go back to what I was talking about in the very beginning. So the school system throughout the country is kind of a good, is a good example of an incumbent system that in general is really resistant to change. Correct. And what's wrong with the concept of, not necessarily as Chris DeMusa blowing it up, but of trying to find ways to improve the system outside the system? And there's some people who believe that, that all, that most of the innovation that's happening in education is happening outside the system, you know, uh, con, um, mm -hmm. even, even um, what, what kids are doing after school. I mean, look at the Korea model. Right. Um, wh what's wrong with that approach? I, there's nothing wrong with it specifically, but we are crazy as a country if we keep paying for this big inefficient system and think it's okay to simply remediate stuff over on the side. There's so much knowledge about how to fix the system, either through quasi-governmental things like charter schools or directly through performance improvements in traditional public school systems like we have right here in DC. So it's just massively inefficient to think we're gonna fix all these problems just by doing things that are remedial outside. The things I like best are when schools bring Khan Academy into the school. So the kids in a classroom just like this, what they're doing is they're accessing Khan Academy and they're working through algebra on Khan Academy. That's the way that I feel like you're maximizing society's resources and getting the best result. Good, let's, uh, let's go to the, the audience. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you have a question, just raise your hand. We'll find, a, we'll, we'll find a microphone for you. Just identify yourself. Um, yes, there, there are two questions over here. We'll, we'll, we'll go to that one first and then you second. Good afternoon, Ms. Bradley. It's a pleasure to, to hear you speak. I wanted to ask you... Well, could you identify yourself? Oh, sure. My name's Todd Wiggins. I'm a, a district resident. And uh, I was, um, in, to some degree, um, a big fan of Mr. Fenty's initiation of trying to improve not only the, the image of, the ed of education in D.C., but also the physical buildings, you know, right. starting the renovations and so on, that I still think are... are culminating even now. Mm -hmm. But can you follow back from Mr. Fenty's attempts and roadblocks that he ran into and somehow associated with Michelle Ree and then leading into Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Right. Gray? Mm -hmm. And then he ran into a few roadblocks, and even though I thought he made a tremendous amount of progress and was a great, I, I feel he was a great mayor. But what, what is DC up against in general as far as an image of having an educational problem uh, versus Fairfax County, Montgomery County, here being the nation's capital, and where are we now? Do you think we've made improvements in the last six years perceptively and, and, and realistically? So there, there are a lot of questions embedded in that, and um, I'll, let me say two things. One thing about politics, and one thing about a concrete example of our improvement. So as to politics, uh, we, we are the fastest improving city in the country, and we're one of the two fastest improving states along with Tennessee. 
Uh, that is in part because we've had four leaders who have followed pretty much the same education policies. Mayor Williams, Mayor Fenty, Mayor Gray, and Mayor Bowser. And they've even had quite a few of the same people that they have kept. So Kaya Henderson was Michelle Rees' deputy. Vince Gray kept Kaya Henderson in, or a, a, helped appoint her as Michelle Rees was leaving. And then Kaya Henderson has stayed with Mayor Bowser. That kind of continuity is hugely important. And it makes us very different than other cities all over the country who bring in a new leader, and that new leader throws out the whole set of policies and starts over. And we measure success in this industry in decades, not in mayoral administrations. You know, we're interested in whether the preschool program helps kids graduate from college, and you need to stay with things for a while. So one small concrete example, have we changed the image of DC? When Michelle re-arrived, we had a terrible teacher shortage. It was hard to get qualified people to come and teach in Washington, D.C. That doesn't mean we didn't have great teachers here. We did, but we had plenty of vacancies, and the vacancies were every single year. I call D.C. now talent mecca because so many people want to be here and want to teach, and they want to come from all over the country to be here. So there isn't really a teacher shortage here anymore. There's a quality war going on trying to get better and better teachers and trying to get high quality ones. But the set of policies that those leaders have followed have dramatically changed the human capital set of policies that we have here in DC, all to the good. By the way, this quality war uh, mm -hmm. is an interesting subject that we explored when I was in Dallas. The, the, and I don't know how it works in Washington, but is it easy for a teacher to move from one system to the next and maintain his or her pensions? Because that's a big issue. Well, there's only a pension in the DCPS system. Oh, so so, so it's, it's not, a, you're saying it's not an issue? Or yeah, although I think a lot of um, people don't look at their career as being just in any industry, just in one, for one employer anymore. Right. So I think the, I'm not sure that there's a lot of systems all the where, teachers are where, counting on it. Where teachers are locked in. And so you don't have the competition among the systems. Yeah, I don't know enough about what happens to the pension if a teacher leaves DCPS and moves to a charter to be able to answer it specifically. Um, and, and also, just on your uh, talking about the continuity of leadership, um, is there an advantage to having a, a school system where the mayor is in charge as opposed to a school board? So I think it's huge, and I think the progress we've had here shows you in a very concrete way that uh, you can make a lot more progress if you have mayoral control than if you have a, an elected school board that feels very responsible to um, many different constituencies at a time. The mayor is really responsible for one thing, and that's getting results in the school system. And it's just a whole different political dynamic if a big school board representing diverse interests is responsible for making the decisions. Mm -hmm. I also think DC, <laughs> is really helped that we are both a city and a state. Mm. And those actors are the same. Mm. So the decision-making structure is just much simpler here. That's one of the reasons Common Core has been easier here than in other places, is because the same actors are deciding for our city and our state, because it's one and the same. I'm, I remember having, years ago, having a meeting with um, Secretary Duncan and talking about all you know, the importance of school leadership and everything. He said. It's all about governance. And I don't know, I don't know if it's all about governance, but the, this governance piece is tremendously important. School boards don't work in a lot of places. Right. I mean, I, they certainly do some places. Yeah, sure. Um, we have been better off, I believe, under this system. It gets to be a little tricky to make sure that there is adequate community voice built into every decision. And I think that to the extent that there was a valid criticism about the Fenty Re era. It was that community voice, many people in the community really felt the community voice was not honored. Mm -hmm. And so I think the subsequent administration has really tried to fix that and been much more attentive to making sure that there is authentic ways for community voice to influence decisions. Question over here. Thank you. <clears throat> My name's Dee Young. 
Uh, I'm from Montgomery County, Maryland. It's supposed to be a, a top schools, and I'm sure my two children are graduate from Montgomery County, and they bring it up here really to raise the standard of the county. But the county basically tried to deteriorate it, label them failure. And so I just have to turn them around so they graduate from MIT, and my son is double major in math and physics in three years, youngest in the college level. So I just want, I, I have a long history observed Montgomery County and what they are doing wrong. So I'm sure that the Reese or Charter School, maybe in some way they can improve something if they do it right. But the problem is system going this way, they direct the resources to benefit something they are not supposed to be received. And they have a college and the farm to subsidize the non-profit organization. They use uh, education farm or a city farm to go to the non-profit organization and all the land or resources. Eventually, you don't see where they go. So I just wonder uh, if a, you a can. Complicated question, but let, let me, can I just, uh, can I just redirect? Say, uh, yeah. I, I, think, I think you got your point across, which was excellent. <laughs> But it, do you work with uh, Montgomery County Schools? So I wish I worked with Montgomery County Schools, but I don't. My organization is really DC focused only. And then one of the nonprofit boards I serve on that I spend a lot of time with is Teach for America. That works in um, Prince George's County, Maryland, and in Washington, DC, and maybe next year in a Virginia County. Uh, so unfortunately, um, I don't have any Montgomery County specific knowledge. I was a big fan of Josh Stars, who was your superintendent until just recently. Uh, and I think the county doesn't know who it's going to appoint next. Yeah, no, recently, the okay. Washington DC newspaper just say new millennials, they don't want to stay in DC. So would that affect the teacher's number and quality? Well, that's, we're going to have to move on because we have some other questions. So um, yes, right over here. Hi, Luann McNabb with the National Council of Teachers of English. You had mentioned a school where the principal only let them do personalized instruction. They didn't want. How does this prepare students, though, to go to, let's say, a large university where you have massive classes of hundreds of students in a class? I just was curious. Um, so the school I'm talking about is an elementary school. So I suspect what really happens is that those experiences have to change for kids as they get to high school so that they are prepared for college. Uh, that school had a station rotation model. So it wasn't all on computers. It was partly on computers, partly in group work, <coughs> partly working with a teacher. And I think that the missing piece that's been identified for so many kids coming from urban school systems is even if they go to a high-performing school, they haven't been allowed to have the agency over their own work that they will need in college. And I'm not an expert in the high school to college transition, but what I've heard from people at KIPP and other places is that building the student agency, the student ownership over the pace and path of their work is one of the most important things they think they need before going to college. I haven't heard anybody say that being able to navigate in a really big class is the thing that's proved challenging to kids later. So does your organization have, have a problem with, <coughs> with this kind of model that we're looking at? No, 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 no. I just was curious when the principal says, no, 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 you can't have a group. I said, wow, let's go to a, like a group VA, and they shouldn't have chemistry class for 300 kids. Yeah. <laughs> no, it just struck me. No, no, right. we don't. We, we represent all teachers in all kinds of schools, all kinds of counties. Good. And do you, do you find teachers having, being scared of or nervous about blended learning in the classroom? John Tangney from McLean. Um, you're encouraging experimentation and, mm -hmm. and generating many, many experiments. When will you be ready, do you think, to sort among the experiments to so, find those that are effective or yeah. most effective? That's a really good question. And I would mm -hmm. encourage you to think about the test scores that are coming up soon, I guess. Think about them in which way? Oh, as a possible uh, sorting mechanism. Ah. Yeah, although since this is the first year with Common Core, it's not going to tell us a whole lot. Um, so just at, at a large level, 
the perch I come from is I'm running a philanthropic organization. So I have to allocate time and capital across all of these ideas. And my organization actually allocates still a lot toward what I'll call the blue chip part of the, um, the sector, the things that are proven, that are working, uh, the KIPs of the world, everything else. I look at the technology and the blended learning investments as my risk capital. And like any other good portfolio, I'm not putting all my bets on the risk portion of the portfolio. But that is where I think some of the highest returns are going to be. Not everything's going to pay off, but some things will. So my guess is that about half of these experiments will, this is just my own instinct, will bear fruit in some significant way. And the field is already all over culling those lessons. The RAND Corporation did a study of all I think it's 23 of the Gates Foundation grantees trying this. This school was in that study. And they found that two-thirds of the kids had significant gains in math and in reading across the 23 schools. And that was compared to virtual twins in other schools who had all the same student characteristics but not doing the blended learning. So I look at it and I think that the research part of the field is all over this. My estimate is we'll get to about half. The Gates Foundation grantees had two-thirds of their schools. And I think we're going to know a little bit more every single year. So we know some things now. We're going to keep knowing more and more. You know, I think this is such an important question because you have thousands of school districts. There are, there are lots of people in the, in the field of trying new things. Right. And yet the information is not there. I mean, it's not, I wouldn't say it's not there, but it's, it's hard to come by to find out what's working, what's not working. And in fact, even the, the research to determine whether it's working or not working is not, I don't, I don't think it's shared all that broadly. And that, that, is some, that, that is a role for technology, right? Or do you, feel, or do you think I'm wrong? I mean, do, you, do you think that, that if somebody comes up with a great idea, so think about this, you know, if somebody comes up with a great idea for a new, I don't know, you know uh, computerized watch, Mm -hmm. uh, people are going to learn about it really quickly. But if someone comes up with a new classroom setup, um, I, don't, I don't know how quickly uh, news travels that, wow, this, is, this turns out to be very successful. So I think I kind of disagree. There is a. Oh, go ahead. A, you, can act. A, you can really okay. disagree. There's a big, vibrant blogosphere talking about all this stuff constantly. There are probably six different ed tech websites or newsletters that I hear from every single day. So if I were a classroom teacher saying, I want to do something, I don't know what to do, there are lots of places to get the idea. What's hard is that teachers are so busy that they need the structured time and space mm. to be able to try some of that stuff. So you need lots of things like the teacher fellowship that we have, which if there are things like that happening around the country that actually give teachers and groups of educators the time and space and support to try stuff. So the, the, the information side of it, I think, is there. There haven't been a lot of RAND studies validating which things are best. But I also think it would be a mistake to say everybody has to do this. Right. Because we don't know yet what is going to work for every set of kids and every set of students. And maybe that's the whole point, is that innovation allows you to do things a little bit differently school by school. So, so that is something the technology is being very helpful in, mm -hmm. that, that you have this big blogosphere so people will learn. Right. But, but I guess it's also not so easy to implement, that even if you right. found, oh, this is, this, is a, this is a great new curriculum, this is really working, to actually put it into effect through the bureaucracy of a school system is not so easy. All right, uh, question, yes, sir. Uh, my name is Mike. I am an adjunct professor over at Marymount University, and I previously taught at Sidwell Friends School uh, for a number of years. And um, I have a question. I'm an alumnus. Oh, and so is David. And so is my husband. Right. Hello, friends. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was teaching someone last night about the meaning of the word friends with a capital F. Um, but I'm, I have a question combining both the topic of uh, talent, a word you've used mm -hmm. many times here tonight, uh, and, and the quality of teaching, along with performance. Um, reviews or, or, or standardized testing scores, perhaps. Um, and I hope this isn't a naive question or off-topic, but is there are there any is there any research on uh, the difference in terms of like performance reviews of 
those teachers we have in the classroom that got an education degree or perhaps a master's or PhD in education and how they're doing in the classroom versus teachers who don't. They just know the material. Um, they have a wealth of knowledge to share and they're very good at sharing it or maybe not so good at sharing it. And this maybe gets into the uh, difference between teaching at a public school, which you need certain credentials and you need that education degree right. versus a private school. So is there any data to say that the education degree majors are actually teaching better than those from the quote private sector. So, I mean, Dimitri, you may remember the name of the study. Maybe six or seven years ago, there was a study looking at whether getting a master's degree once you were in the classroom made any difference to teacher performance, and the answer was no. And do you remember who did the study, Dimitri? David Coleman talks about it all the time. Yeah. I feel like it may have been Wyckoff or Goldhaber, but maybe not. Okay. It, it's easy to Google and it's easy to find. And what the study was trying to do was to say, don't pay teachers more because they have taken time out of the classroom to go get a master's degree, which was the old way of doing things, right? If you got your master's degree, you got the bump in salary. Pay teachers more if they are proving that they are effective with their kids. And of course, the tricky thing there is that you really need multiple measures of effectiveness, not just test scores. Yes. Hi, um, I'm Alex Rush from Mathematica. Um, I can talk to you about the evidence on teachers in a second, um, but I actually wanted to follow up on the previous question about evidence. Um, I think it's really encouraging that there are lots of blogs out there where people um, sort of can suggest what they think is working, but I think there really is a lack of actual evidence about what is effective. Um, and I think part of it is that there aren't good there is an agreement on what effective means in every case. Right. Um, but the Department of Ed just funded um, a project to do rapid cycle evaluations of technology product, product, products. Um, and I'm actually leading it, so I'm super excited Great. to hear um, awesome. all of this. We get um, to have you up here next. Yeah, <laughs> no, I'd be happy to talk to you. I mean, so basically I want to say like there is, we are working on it. The Department of Ed want, like realizes that this normal research pace isn't like adequate to this field. And so, you know, we're going to spend the next couple of years trying to figure it out. And we would love, you know, to hear what you think and, um, you know, get lots of input on this. That's Good. great. Thank you. Um, did you want to? Okay, go ahead. Sorry. Wait one second. Catherine, you've talked a lot mm -hmm. about Armin Choksi. Uh, you've talked a lot mm -hmm. about innovation that's taking place. And everyone assumes innovation is a good thing. But some innovations work, some, some innovations don't work. What happens to the kids where the innovations don't work? And play that out for me. It doesn't work because? The test scores go down. They might not even just stay the same. Uh, you know, so I mean, we, we are in sort of in the experimental, as I understand right. it, I don't know too much about this field. But right. from what I gather, you're talking about a lot of experimentation that's, and like experimentation in any field, some experiments are successful, right. however you define that, and some are not. Yeah. So what happens to those kids where the experiments are not successful? So you hope that what you've done by creating a culture of innovation is getting enough rapid iteration of ideas that if things aren't working, you're changing very, very quickly. And I think that's the whole point of moving to this kind of model of classroom. But you're hitting on something which is, I think, core to this sector. And that is everyone's afraid, even though the system is what we call broken, everyone's afraid to try new things because you're really afraid to experiment on kids. And what if you do something that's worse? And of course, that traps people into not taking risks. So the place I'm very comfortable is if you have excellent educators and great leaders in schools, you should be able to iterate rapidly enough that if things are not working, you change very quickly everyone knows how to go back to the old baseline, um, which we don't want to do because it hasn't been working for enough kids. But that's not a hard thing to do. What's hard is to create something new. May You're, I just, yeah. Follow up? Mm -hmm. so yes. Do we have the mechanisms by which we can determine results fairly rapidly to be able to make those rapid adjustments, or is there a lag? So every, it's different school by school, depending on what kind of technology is used and how comfortable the faculty is using data to drive instruction. But the best of what you're seeing here, you're never waiting till the end of the year to know what a kid knows. The teacher's getting almost constant data feedback from the program. What did they finish? What did they master? What did they learn? And when you see that small group, which 
in some schools we work with, that small group is one to three kids that the teacher's pulling. And they're pulling the kids that the adaptive program tells them are behind and need that extra teacher support. So not every set of teachers is comfortable using data, but it is now there and is now possible. And in no school should they be finding out at the end of the year that the kid didn't learn anything. Um, actually, this question reminds me that this is, after all, the American Enterprise Institute. And so, so we believe in markets. And one of the problems with school systems is there's no exit. There's no, you know, Hirschman exit and voice. There's no, there's, if, if something's not working in, in any other uh, walk of life, like if you go to a movie and you don't like the movie, you can leave and go to another movie. Uh, can't do that. It's very hard to do that in schools, and that's one of the reasons that, that we don't get the changes that produce improvement the way that we do in other parts of society. So is that, uh, is that anything that, that concerns you? Do you think that charter schools take care of that problem? Or do we have to hope that this experiment that didn't work and, and maybe harming the kids in some way gets fixed the next year? rather than having the kids say, well, or the parents of the kids say, well, it's not working, we're gonna to go to another school. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of choice in all DC schools right now. Only about a third of kids just go to their neighborhood public school. About a third of kids choose a DCPS school that is not their neighborhood school. And then the other, little more than a third, really, go to charter schools. So the, the whole concept of parent choice is alive and well here. The thing we don't have is we don't have enough super high quality choices. Mm -hmm. So I look at it and I think there's no parent who is enrolling their child in a school right now in DC that doesn't know what they're getting. And if they don't like it, they really have a lot of places they can go. Now, they don't always get their first choice. That's a problem. We need more high quality choices. But there's a fair amount of mobility and a fair amount of ability for parents to choose where they want their, how they want their children to be educated. You know, you said uh, earlier that DC has become a talent mecca. Mm -hmm. And I have to say that uh, one reason is the work of your foundation. So thank you very much. Thank you for, for being here tonight. And uh, thank you, audience. Thank you. Thank you.